The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started because we're a little bit past time and we have a lot to cover today. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm sharing my screen so you should see this title slide with a great piece of student art from one of Drew University's public collections. Um, and as you, I'm sure, already know, today we are talking to Jennifer Heise and Andrew Bonamici from Drew University. So Jennifer is the reference librarian and the coordinator of digital services at Drew, and Andrew is their university librarian. Um, so before we jump in and kind of start talking about their specific projects, I have a little bit of webinar housekeeping to do. Um, if you, you were muted automatically when you logged in, um, and in order to prevent kind of ambient and background noise, we're going to go ahead and keep people muted. But um, feel free as we're going through, if you have questions about what we're discussing, to just enter your questions into the questions box, which is on that go to webinar control panel that should have popped up on, on the right of your screen when you logged in. And we will kind of review those as soon as we have a chance or at the end of the session. But I do think our plan is to kind of pause for questions as we move through some of these different collections. So if you have a question when we pause, feel free to just raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Okay, so, so I think that is all that I had to run through, aside from mentioning that this session is being recorded. Um, and so if you, you'll receive a copy of the recording after the webinar, and then we'll also share it on the discussion list as well. So with all of that said, let's go ahead and jump in. And what I wanna do first is have Jennifer and Andrew, if you guys could just kind of talk a little bit about your roles at Drew and your involvement in digital collections on campus, um, I think that would be a great place to start. So we know a little bit more about who you are and what you guys do. Sure, that that sounds good. Um, thank you, Hannah. We're really happy to be here today. This this is Andrew. I'll turn it over to Jennifer in just a minute. Um, I'm the university librarian. I started here in January of this year, so I'm a relatively new member of the Drew community. But to give you a little bit of background about uh, the university itself, we're located in Madison, New Jersey, which is about 38 miles or 48 kilometers west of Manhattan. And I think you'll be hearing more about that strong connection to the New York metropolitan area later on in the presentation. So the university started out as a Methodist seminary in 1867. There was an undergraduate college added in 1928, which is now a high quality co-educational small liberal arts program uh, with about 1700 undergrad students. We're, we're one of four Phi Beta Kappa chapters in the state of New Jersey. We have some distinctive undergraduate programs and opportunities, the New York semesters that happens in a number number of areas, in, including the arts. Uh, the theater programs are very highly rated here. Uh, we have a very interesting program called RISE. RISE stands for Research Institute for Scientists Emeriti. There's a, a large industrial base of you know, pharmaceutical, life sciences, bio, corporate uh, research offices of all kinds here in the Northern New Jersey area. And a lot of those uh, PhD scientists who worked in those areas want to stay connected to their field. And, and one way of doing that is by working with us on our campus in mentoring undergraduate researchers. So that's been a, a really interesting, strong program. Yeah, go ahead, and Jennifer. In, in fact, um, a recent Nobel Prize winner, uh, Dr. Campbell, mm -hmm. was is part of the RISE program and worked extensively with some of our undergraduates. Yeah. So um, another thing that's distinctive about Drew is that we're, we're not only an undergraduate institution at all. We have uh, the theological school, which is the, the deepest uh, roots of the institution, and the Casperson, Casperson School of Graduate Studies. And there are a number of degrees offered at the master's and doctoral level through the Theo and Casperson schools. 
and the current graduate student enrollment is approximately 600. So uh, we feel that we have uh, an obligation to maintain some fairly you know, solid research level collections to support the graduate curriculum, as well as a, a really solid undergraduate experience for our students. So uh, another thing, this is a little more recent. Uh, we're a blended organization that includes both the library, the archives, and, uh, and instructional technology staff and services together as a unified team. And we think that is going to give us some opportunities to leverage uh, digital resources and content managed by the library into environments like the learning management system and the face-to-face -face classroom instruction environment, as well as labs and uh, co-curricular and experiential experiences. Um, we also have a long-standing, I think it goes back to about 1982, um, arrangement between, contractual arrangement between our special collections division and the United Methodist Church's General Commission on Archives and History. Um, they're housed in our Methodist Library building, um, so we have two organizations in there. So we have a huge collection of Methodist material as well as partnering with uh, the General Commission. Yeah, you can think of that as the National Archives of the United <laughs> Methodist Church. Yeah, and that's so, actually one of your forum collections. It's sort of featuring a lot of special material related to that, right? Yes. Yeah. So I, I think that's adequate for uh, a brief introduction to Drew, but I do encourage all of you to get on the drew.edu website and take a look. It's a, it's a beautiful campus and we have a lot of very interesting and uh, high quality academic programs. Right, and when, so when did Drew become forum subscribers? Because it's fairly recently, right? Within the last two years? In, um, in August of 2016, um, we had been looking at different um, Im institutional repository options and image re repository options because we had a huge backlog, still do, of um, different kinds of images that we didn't have a good way to store, access, and um, provide metadata for, and we didn't find that the existing institutional repository options um, that were out there did a great job with um, simple images as opposed to PDF documents or, you know, audio documents. Yeah, I think that's kind of a common situation to find yourself in. So, um, we one of the collections that we're going to talk about here is the Nestorian Crosses collection. And I, I thought we'd start there because that was your first collection that you added to um, added to Forum, and it kind of served as a proof of concept for moving forward with the subscription and with adding other collections, right? Yes. Yes. So we, we started with the Nestorian Cross collection. Um, the Nestorian crosses are um, about 400 brass items that date back to the um, Yuan, Yuan dynasty in um, China, um, goes from, which went from 1260 to 1360. That's the time period. Um, they were collected by um, one of the, a, a missionary from Drew, who left them to us. We have the second largest collection of these in the in the world. The biggest collection is in the Hong Kong um, Museum. And we had recently had a scholar come and do some work with that collection. So they had made an uh, Excel spreadsheet inventorying the collection and had taken photographs. So we thought that would be a great place to start. Um, we handed over the Excel spreadsheet. I believe it was to you, Hannah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and Hannah set up a, a, a sample project for us, and we just went. We were we fell in love with it, and we started um, working with it um, there. The only the, the biggest hitch in the get along was that when our special collection staff came to look at the um, images, it turned out we had to rephotograph them. So we have only about three quarters of the um, artifacts 
photograph, but we have both the back, the front and the back of many of them um, photographed. Yeah, and that's actually one of the things that I noticed today is that you have um, these sets created that kind of include all of the images of the backs and then the images of the fronts of the objects. And um, one of so I was really interested when I first saw this collection because um, when you hear Nestorian crosses, um, this is not necessarily what you think the images are going to include. Um, and so I was kind of curious, do you, what's the history of these particular types of crosses? Because they, they tend to come from Eastern countries, right? And I'm just not sure that I had seen a collection of these objects before um, you guys became forum subscribers. These items um, were all found in a, local, in a specific place um, and in China and they were dated to a Nestorian um, Christian community, um, which um, comes out of um, circa 431 AD. They split off um, from the general line of the Christian church and they moved east um, the, the, down the Silk Road into China and down into Southern India. These they're called crosses, um, and we uh, many of them do have cross features, but a number of them are um, very unusual. We have a lot of bird motifs, some of mm -hmm. which are also cross motifs. <laughs> um, we have circles and squares, and there's one, if you go to the conversations set, um, you'll see one that I call the, bur the rabbit duck because it doesn't look like anything so much as perhaps a rabbit and perhaps a duck um, and the conversation set. Let's see. And I have fallen in love with these artifacts, really. Ah, there it is, below the star. Oh, I see what you mean. It kind of has ears. <laughs> <laughs> My rabbit, because if you look at one way, it's kind of like a duck, and if you look at one way, it's kind of like a rabbit. <laughs> Um, but I've fallen in love with them and I find them somewhat mysterious because some of them still have, and, and I've handled them. If you come to Drew, we will give you white gloves and you can handle them. Um, and they still have this, what people think is ink, but there are some that still have enamel on them. And this is a fascinating sidelight that I had never heard of before, and I don't think most people have. And so this is this is the first collection that once we have completed it, we definitely want to um, publish it, you know, um, put it onto the Digital Public Library of America so people can find it and find out about it and perhaps come here and visit it. Yeah, I'm curious. So now that you've made this collection available on campus and it's it is so unique, do students come and see the physical objects in addition to accessing the digital versions um, online? We've had one or two students come and um, visit the physical objects, though we're not sure whether that was because of a program we did on it um, on campus or because they've seen it on Art Store. Um, but we are plan planning to make a big splash as soon as the entire collection is finished and and um, published. That, so what do you mean by a big splash? How are you planning to, um, to call it, attention to it? Yeah, we've publicized it already through our social media. Mm -hmm. We put up some, we put it on our website, but we're going to probably have a collection opening and perhaps do a digital exhibit on our Omeka server with these and publicize it to other um, special collections um, we have the opportunity to do, to spread this information out through ATLA, the American Theological mm -hmm. Library Association as well. Oh, that sounds great. Um, I'm curious, as we're looking at this particular record, I'm noticing the different cataloging screens that are in use here, and I'm curious, how are these how are these different? How are the cleanup fields in this screen different from, is this an all fields screen? Yes, okay. there's an all field screen. 
That's just so we can look at the whole thing. Mm -hmm. The ad image screen was created so that um, we could have student workers upload the images as they went and not have to worry about, you know, hitting the wrong key or typing in the wrong place. Right, right. I see all these fields are locked. So this is great use of that feature <laughs> to sort of keep them from overwriting important information that shouldn't be changed. Yeah. And the cleanup um, field, that um, shows only things that either people might need to change, like checking the width, the height, and so forth, mm -hmm. where they might want to add additional. For instance, we have a bucket field for the condition, and we probably, over time, will want to change that over to the controlled list of conditions. That'll be part of the cleanup process. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this is, you've gone ahead and created a controlled list for pretty straightforward condition notes, and then that way you don't end up with inconsistently applied terms throughout the collection. Yes, because the original spreadsheet has the notations of the original researcher. Right. So a good but or piece missing. Yeah, so I am mentioning the spreadsheet again. I feel like I'm... Um, this was obviously an unusually charmed start to a digital collections project because you kind of had this perfectly formatted existing metadata spreadsheet and these existing digital images that corresponded to each item. But I am curious if you have any advice for other people who are kind of getting started with new projects about kind of what they should try and square away before they get started. Um, it's sort of uh, worked out very well for you guys that you had exactly everything you needed. But did you guys learn any lessons when you went through this project? Because you did end up like re-photographing every object in, in the collection, right? One of the things we learned was to verify our metadata. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, another researcher had been looking at the file, at, at the image, the sorry, the items after the researcher had gone through. Um, and they were not in the same order <laughs> that the spreadsheet showed. So we did a, a certain amount of sleuthing. The other process was um, because we had a number of different student photographers to work on the process, we, um, we tried several ways <laughs> to um, do the photography and do the image cropping. So we learned a lot from that. Right, just in the in the imaging process, you mean like learning how to take good, high quality photos of physical objects? Not so much the taking the images, but processing those images for loading. Oh, I see. Right. The and um, mat how we were going to match that up with the existing content. Right, um, and making sure the file names corresponded and pulling everything together. Because this was an example where we didn't have the file name in the spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did you end up adding that kind of information back in? Was it was it a manual process? We manually um, linked the images to the one at a time. We uploaded the image one at a time and added it to the um, the records. Okay. So it was pretty quick though. That's, that sometimes goes faster than you expect it to. It kind of doesn't scale beyond probably a couple of hundred item records, but it is a, a solid option for kind of making sure that you're putting the right image with the right data record, especially if in the project you've already run into the headache that is scrambled data. You, you feel very motivated to make sure <laughs> that you're kind of pairing things up correctly as you go. That makes sense. So um, this, one of the things that you've mentioned a couple of times that I wanted to touch on is the role of student workers in these projects, kind of doing um, data entry, but then also it sounded like helping in the, the actual digitization process and with the imaging. Um, and this kind of circles back to something Andrew was discussing earlier about the role of experiential um, education at Drew and kind of involving students in work experiences and mentorship experiences. And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit, just because Jen, I know that you have kind of a hand in all of the digital projects that are that are underway and 
on the horizon. If you can talk a little bit as a manager about the experience of trying to involve student workers in these projects and make sure they're getting relevant work experience and kind of developing them in that way. Because I think that's something that a lot of people deal with in, in digital collections. We've been very lucky that our special collections department has a very strong tradition of bringing on students, students from our art history department, graduate students from our history and culture department to work with collections doing um, cataloging, you know, doing metadata creation, doing digitization. Um, so we have a very strong culture of handing students a project, helping them find out how to do it, and then letting them go. So if you look at some of the projects we have, like our Methodist images, that, those were all digitized by a single graduate student. Oh, wow. Yeah, Kwon yeah. Yu. I don't know what we'll do when he graduates. <laughs> but in addition to that, we're trying to find good ways to preserve our students' materials, which is why we have the student art project. That's kind of a, mm -hmm. a seed for um, archiving images of the studio art students um, work. They will, they are all creating their own um, artists domain, their own website as part of their professional development course. And the long-term plan is that we will archive images for that from that course, as well as any other images that are suggested, nominated by their faculty into our student art collection. What we have right here in our student art collection right now is um, images from the last two senior shows. Mm -hmm. uh, those photographs were taken by the campus photographer and so you can see that a lot of them are kind of stage shots as opposed to what you would really want to see as a single image of an art piece. Um, right, and you had mentioned as well that um, you know the students are also sort of photographing their own work and maintaining independent portfolios and you're kind of looking to leverage the fact that they already do that on their own and have them submit those images that they're already taking um, and add those to this collection, right? That's sort of the next step. Win. Then we have an archive copy if anything happens to their website mm -hmm. that they can get back and we can show people what our student art material our student art students studio art students do in their classrooms and the range and depth of their work um, yeah this is andrew and i'll i'll just weigh in a little bit with what i think is a, a really important strategic imperative not just for for us here at drew but for the the library and our archives cultural heritage community generally uh, on a campus Involving our students is is so beneficial, and I think if we design some of these services uh, around uh, opportunities for students to work with them, get their hands hands in it, uh, either in an employment situation, an internship situation, and then also celebrate and preserve you know, their work uh, through through our repositories and our archival collections. I mean, it's uh, it's not just a workforce i mean it's uh it's part of the education and it's really setting them up for alternative academic careers or for being you know really um, smart capable contributors to uh, a gallery or museum environment if that's the direction they want to go um i i find you know working with um, with student workers uh, in libraries and archives to be you know, a, a very powerful, uh, beneficial part of the education. So uh, I'm very dedicated to this, and I, I think the more we can refine the workflows and encourage our students to be contributing to the the archival record, um, it's it's sticky. It helps them connect to the institution. They feel the support and the care that we have for their contributions as members of the academy. Um, and at the same time, we're getting work done that we wouldn't possibly have the resources to, to complete without their assistance. 
Yeah, and that's the most important thing to us. But in addition, some of these projects give us the opportunity um, to reach out, for instance, to the museum studies students in our, our, his, um, our history department and say, if you want to know how to do metadata creation and, and um, formatting and editing in JSTOR forum, which is obviously a marketable skill, if you want to be able to take this material and make electronic exhibits out of it um, in Omeka, because we do have an Omeka server and we also partner with the Domain of One's Own um, program out of Reclaim Hosting, that they can add, they can have their own Omeka server. Mm -hmm. If you want to be able to do that, we will work with you and help you do that process so that you can create something that shows off your talent and develop your own skills along the way. Yeah, I think that's a really great point, um, especially when you're dealing with student work, um, because when you when you publish from Forum to an Omeka site, whether or not the content remains in Forum for the long term, the site will sort of persist. Um, so if you if for some reason you sort of retire content from the collection and Forum, like for instance after people graduate, the the Omeka site that it's published to will still it will still include all of the images and it, they can kind of take that site with them out into the world after they leave Drew. So it really is, it's like skill building and then it's also them coming out of it with a portfolio that they can take off into the world. But then it also seems like um, there's an interesting, one of the, the problems that I know institutional repositories face, and this kind of came up on our on a discussion list thread earlier today, is that um, encouraging people to submit their work is really the challenge. It tends actually not to be um, technical technical issues or problems with the, the solution that the institution has chosen. It's actually just getting the buy-in from people on campus to remember and make a priority out of contributing their work to the repository. And it kind of seems like um, having, having student workers working in forum on other projects is also a sneaky way to expose them to the system and show them how easy it is to contribute their content. So like if you had student workers who were in the studio art program and they worked on a project their freshman year and their senior year, you went to their course and you said, we'd love for you all to submit your senior projects to forum. And there are five of them who remember how to use forum from their freshman year working on that project. You've kind of got some some ground laid in terms of getting that buy-in and getting contributions. Yeah, I think it's it's almost like a um, electronic thesis and dissertation uh, program. Over time, it just becomes part. Of, it's an expectation. You know, uh, can be published in policies. Yeah. You know, so I don't think we're quite there yet with the, with art and JSTOR forum, but it's a similar kind of a concept. You know, the if the academic departments start to see the benefit of their students' work being, being visible, then they will start to you know, build that in, into their programs and their syllabi. Then it'll, um, it'll have even more traction. Oh, yeah. yeah. The studio art is mm -hmm. really excited about this. In fact, for the last two years, everything, every piece that we have in here, we have gotten permission. You know, we send over a, a, a release form and the student artists submit you know sign a, sign off on it and send it back to us mm -hmm. so we have we each student actually signs off on permission for us to display these images yeah that's really nice and it's also it's especially nice given that studio art um, students and faculty tend not to be the traditional demographic of an institutional repository so giving them an opportunity to contribute their work in this way and then making it available, um, it seems like a, a nice opportunity for them as well, especially given the tie-in with publishing images of um, student and faculty art into art stores so that it's all discoverable in one place has obvious convenience for the people that are accessing the published versions of the images. Yeah, our studio art faculty are very excited about that. Yeah, and there. So we had a question um, 
about the actual records in the project because someone noticed that some of them are unpublished. And I did just want to point out that these, there are several works in this collection that are published and that you guys do make it available as a public collection. So these are not just discoverable to Drew users of ArtStore, they're um, publicly discoverable to anyone, whether or not they're logged in. And uh, very soon, they'll be discoverable by searching in major search engines. So you're really giving a big boost to the visibility of your students' work. Yes, and you'll see there's there's the set from last summer, which were already published right. from, from 2017. The set from 2018, um, we have uh, an art history graduate who is now working for the uni for the library, and I want her to check these over before I publish them because I am neither a cataloger nor nor an art history student. <laughs> so I like to have a second set of eyes. Um, yeah. But she's special collections, and they have huge numbers of student groups coming mm -hmm. in right now class groups coming in to see their materials. So it's a bit, um, it's a bit uh, busy. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and I also, so I didn't realize that you don't have a cataloging or an art history background. And I feel like if that's um, sort of a, a testament to the fact that you don't have to be an art historian to use art store or forum, then I don't know what is because you <laughs> manage all of these collections and, and run all of these projects and you don't have either of those things. So that's great. <laughs> all right. And I love this piece. I always see this. I'm this, this that piece. Yeah. I always see these and I think I've featured them on the Twitter <laughs> account at least once because I just, I always really like those. Um, all right. So one of the things I also wanted, while we're talking about art projects at Drew, you guys have this really fascinating campus art project that is um, just getting started right now. And I am going to kind of peer pressure you into sharing your, your incomplete work right now and talk a little bit about this project that you've just gotten started on. Because you're using Forum in a really interesting way to kind of um, process this existing paper-based inventory that you have. And so can you can you talk a little bit about this one? Yeah, this is an interesting case. We haven't actually had a conservator for the university art collections, which we don't have a museum, so they're spread all over campus. Mm -hmm. We haven't had a conservator since approximately 1980. <laughs> um, so the last full inventory of the art collections was done in 1980. Um, in typed materials um, in, on cards. And since then, obviously, things have been moved around. We do know that a section of the materials in this inventory are lost because there was a, a fire in the main administration building, and we have a section that's marked burn to ashes, <laughs> where the, the conservator came back, pulled those, those cards, and marked them as lost. But we are trying to match up the inventory with the materials um, we currently have. We've moved a lot of materials into safe, climate-controlled storage um, that we had scattered around the campus, and we're matching those up now. But the first step um, is to find out what we knew about these records beforehand. And you'll see that we have, we have furniture, we have reproductions of etchings, which, you know, <laughs> probably have no value, even if we could find them. But we also have um, unusual artworks, and then we have things like our Methodist collections, which include things like communion sets. Um, I think we have one of Bishop Asbury's communion sets. Mm -hmm. and lots and lots of ceramic busts <laughs> of, of Wesley. Yeah. <laughs> so here's Charles. an example here. Mm -hmm. um, basically, all of these things were inventoried originally. So what we've done is we've scanned them. Obviously, we cannot do any kind of OCR with any um, accuracy. So what we've been doing is we actually have students, and these aren't even the special collections students. Um, they're student workers who work at the desk, mm -hmm. who in their downtime are transcribing the information that's on the inventory 
into the, trans, the, the screen that you see here. Mm -hmm. Once that inventory material is completed, we're gonna take that whole database, copy over the metadata, and start matching that to the existing items. Um, the dream is to have students take an iPad with the in, you know the with the JSTOR forum inventory on it mm -hmm. and take where these items are on display, mark them as you know where they where they are on display and take the picture right there so that we can update the inventory um, pretty much seamlessly. Yeah, so in addition to the items that uh, may still be out and around the campuses, uh, Jen mentioned, we've just uh, put a, a very nice art storage system uh, into special collections and archives that includes a work table. So one of our art history professors who teaches museum studies will actually be working with the special collections staff taking her students in there to do you know, this kind of curatorial and descriptive and analytical work um, in you know, behind the scenes with items that aren't on display. Um, you know, so in addition to some of these older um, Methodist type materials from Drew's heritage, we have some uh, very interesting uh, modern 20, uh, 20th century, mid 20th century work from um, gallerists and, and artists in New York. And uh, there's a woman named Lee Hall who just passed away a couple of years ago and she started the New York semester. Um, she is the author of the very famous and somewhat controversial uh, biography of the de Koonings. Um, mm -hmm. uh, she was an artist in her own right, but also a collector. So we have quite a few things that came from Lee Hall. Um, and then the uh, Betty Parsons, who owned the Betty Parsons Gallery, which is very in instrumental in the uh, abstract expressionist and other mid-century art. We had, she was strongly connected to Drew as well. So we have quite a few uh, works that she collected. So there's quite a bit of, of material out there, uh, works on paper as well as paintings. Yeah, and then, Sorry, and you said, so some of the work is kind of installed around campus, which is one of the things that I was noticing is documented in this physical inventory cataloging screen. But then you're also saying that um, the special collections has been equipped to house these physical art objects. So the, the bulk of the art collection actually lives in special collections. I'm, I'm hoping that as uh, we'll, we'll be pulling some of them in. Yeah, okay. some of them. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the higher value items or, or items that need uh, preservation treatment uh, will be pulling those back in over the, over the next few years to uh, take good care of them. But we do have a huge selection of arts all over mm -hmm. campus, um, which is one of the things people really notice about the campus is that um, there is art, at, you know, in every building. Mm -hmm and all over campus, apparently. Um, do you have a sense of how, what percentage of the objects that are represented in the inventory were actually lost in the fire that you mentioned earlier? Like when students start going around and trying to match these records to objects, what percentage do you think they're gonna find don't have objects anymore? <laughs> well, we know approximately probably between five and 10% were lost, but there are other materials that we're pretty sure um, probably vanished or um, were deaccessioned after 1980, because that's the last inventory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so probably a lot of the study prints, um, we have you know just etchings of, of famous pictures from the early 20th century that are listed in this inventory that probably don't exist anymore simply because they were not useful. Right. They're not or are unusual and they weren't useful anymore. Yeah, one of the things I was wondering, especially as I was going through this set that includes the prints, um, was how many of these images that are sort of uh, paper clipped or glued onto these item records 
in how many cases that is going to end up being the only image that remains of the work. Um, it sounds like it could be a fair, a fair number of them. Well, be if we don't know. Yeah. Um, that, well, there's a lot of materials that we've ex we've um, received since 1980 that aren't in this set because this is not they weren't inventoried. Oh, right. So I guess the the inverse is true, and that's sort of the silver lining, right? Is that you'll discover new treasures that <laughs> that you don't have paper records for, but that have sort of made their way onto campus and also were undocumented. So I see some uh, questions starting to show up in, in the chat. Do you want us to respond to those as we go? Yeah, so the one that I addressed before was about the records being unpublished. Mm -hmm. um, and there, are you seeing additional ones that are? That yeah, but I don't know that they make much sense based yeah, on what you're there talking was, about. I think there was a, a bot that had registered for the webinar and it was sort of spamming in questions. Like bot questions. <laughs> yeah, so I went through and I, I deleted those from my questions pane. But, oh, okay. um, <laughs> so does anybody have any question, any other questions, well, you know, before we talk about any, anything else we may have? Yeah, absolutely. If you have a question and you want to ask on mic, just raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Um, sometimes that's easier than trying to quickly type a question into the box, but feel free to, to weigh in with questions. And I did just want to quickly point out um, when I went to illustrate that the student art collection is publicly available, if you go to the public collections list on Art Store and just search for Drew University, um, you can see that they have the student art collection, the Nestorian crosses, which we have just talked about, and the Methodist image collection are all available there. And those are totally free and open to the public. In the long term, we'll probably also make some of the Drew, image, the, the Drew campus images available, but that's going to require a certain amount of curating, so mm -hmm. we haven't gotten to that point yet. Right. Right. I'm not seeing any hands raised, but I did really quickly just want to touch on one more thing about the way that you've set up this project. Because so I find this in progress art project really fascinating because you, you're kind of I, when we spoke about it before, it seemed like you were not sure what the long term fate of these actual records is, like, you know, like whether you were going to make those available or not. And um, so I think this is a great example of using forum as a processing tool and potentially not even as part of a delivery pipeline, right? Where you're sort of using this as a way to capture and digitize all of the actual descriptive data that's contained within these records. Um, and long term, you don't really know whether or not you're going to publish the images from the inventory. And to that end, you've done some interesting things with the way that you've set up the forms and you guys, you make really great use of controlled lists to kind of um, rein in the, the use of different terms and minimize free text entry errors. Um, but you've also split, so you've got a cataloging screen here that's specifically for the fields that the students would be transcribing data into. So this, this screen is for, let's switch to like this one. Each of these fields basically corresponds to a field that's represented on this form. And so they're just entering the relevant um, pieces of information that they're sort of seeing and deciphering from the image. But then you've also got this physical inventory screen, which, um, basically is a guide to like where on campus this material, the physical version of, or the physical item documented in this record is located. Is that right? That's correct. So yeah. this, this is the information, this is the historical information now, but as you can see, we've added, we have a controlled list of Drew Campus locations. Mm -hmm. You can just pick the building it's in um, and you know, give us the information about what the room is and any notes. Yeah, I think this is a really smart way of using cataloging screens and controlled lists. And so I just wanted to call that out before we 
um, moved on just in case it wasn't clear to other people um, how much work had gone into structuring this so that you're able to really effectively capture the information that's there and then also kind of set yourself up for the next step of this project, which will be physically locating all of these objects <laughs> and <laughs> retracing the steps around campus. Um, that struck me as being really forward thinking with the way that you set up the project. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right, so I, I wanna jump in and talk about the, the third public collection that we haven't touched on yet. So that's gonna be the Methodist image collection. And we've got about 12 minutes left. So I, I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about this because you have done another really interesting thing here where when users see this collection, they it's just the Methodist image collection. There's over 4,000 images included. And it's kind of this mix of portraits and um, images of architecture and you can, I'll let other people sort of click through and see everything that's contained there. But on the back end, this is actually two different collections that you manage. So you've got one for the people and one for the places that are represented. That's and right. I, yeah, so can you talk a little bit about the decision to sort of parse those and compartmentalize them? Well, all of these started out as part of a Flickr set. Um, they were digitized by one of our graduate students and the information we had about them was all encapsulated in the file names. And as you know, Flickr doesn't give us a lot to work with. Right. But So we started with the people, but when we started to add the places, I looked at this and said, we need, there's other information you want about places that isn't the same as the information you want about people. And so rather than try to squish them together into one format, we made two formats, which both published to the same um, the same set mm -hmm. online. So we have one that gives information about people, and then the one you're looking at, the places, gives information with addresses mm -hmm. and who owns the building and what the architecture is, which is certainly not a question you would want to ask about a person. <laughs> 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 and so what we've been able to do is take the information we currently have for each of these photos, um, fill it in, um, and we've had students actually add more information like the World Methodist Council Museum. What's their address? We have somebody look that up and put it into the database. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, so it, it's a living document um, as we go along. We did the same thing with the people because we do have files of history. Um, the people is the one that we're most that most people are interested. This is an outward facing collection. Um, we get a lot of questions from genealogists, from religious history people who want images of specific persons or who just want to do a little looking through to see um, about how people looked in a particular time of history. Mm -hmm. And that's where this comes in handy because people can just browse through it. Um, we started out with just the file names um, and then we downloaded the file names and teased them apart with Excel, put them back in there and then special collections students and the students who report directly to me have been going through our records and looking for information about the people and adding that if it's available. Mm -hmm. And then we republish it with the information. So that's a very like phased approach to sort of uh, scraping all the metadata you can out of this very minimal um, resource that you had, which was just descriptively named images. That's extremely resourceful. And um, I think there's a lot of, especially with this type of collection, which is sort of has broad interest to, especially um, like hobbyist researchers, which I think a lot of genealogy kind of falls into that category. Um, a Flickr was a very common 
delivery platform for that type of content. Um, and I'm curious if the, the end users of this collection, so you were kind of mentioning researchers in the community, they're primarily external. They're primarily like not Drew University affiliates, right? These are just sort of community members who are browsing the collection. They are external, though it is absolutely true that in many cases we have a contractual obligation to them because of our contractual obligation to the United Methodist mm -hmm. um, Church. And is the obligation just to make the content available or is there um, sort of a, a reference component to that as well? Is a certain mm -hmm. reference Yeah, component. so uh, the collections of the General Commission share the same building as the Drew University owned collections. The, uh, we support their researchers with our reading room um, uh, with a certain amount of, of cataloging and processing and preservation support. Um, so it's a, it's a combination of uh, library service levels as well as facilities mm -hmm. and, and equipment and storage. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. So then the, the availability of the digital collection is kind of an extension of that. That's correct. Yeah, they do a lot of their own digitization too. You know, they they have a DSpace repository, um, and you know they're they're continuing to to build out uh, their archival collections too. Is um, I'm curious. So this collection, when we were looking at the published version, it was over four thousand images. Is that the entirety of it, or is there uh, content that remains to be digitized? Well, we have mm -hmm. a collection of approximately 2,000 images that are already digitized, but we're going to have to do a lot of digging to identify them because they're event images. So there oh. are multiple people in the images. Um, this is all stuff that people gave to the Methodist Library mm -hmm. um, in one way or another. There are also images of other types that are kept, you know, in the collections, but this is the biggest collection of general materials, which is why we started with this. Mm -hmm. But those other 2,000 images are probably going to be a research project for someone. <laughs> <laughs> we have to figure out, um, will we add a different project to handle those? Because they're not single or, um, you know, two-person images. They are um, pictures of events. They are pictures of crowds of people, mm -hmm. which doesn't fit neatly into the either the Methodist people or Methodist places metadata scheme. Yeah, I'm curious. So locally, when you're getting ready to kind of undertake a new digital project like that, what's the decision-making process for for determining whether or not you are going to just create a new project in forum or try to add those images to one of your existing projects is it purely like a metadata content consideration or um do you do you have sort of policies defined locally about what gets new collections versus what goes into other things we haven't yet defined a policy we're a very small staff so we mm -hmm. sit down together and say will this work <laughs> Yeah. You're a small staff, but you've got a lot of collections already. <laughs> You're approaching. We're, we're we're also trying to develop criteria too. So where we're we're evaluating the okay, well, what'll what's this going to take? How much labor are we going to put into it? Will there is there research interest? What's the impact? Um, how does it align with our curriculum? Do we have known research applications or demand from? Uh, from current or likely future users. So we, we are starting to have some of those conversations as well. You know, it's, uh, we're not necessarily just digitizing because oh, it's no. there. <laughs> you know, when it comes to creating the project itself, create, yes. that's when we sit down mm -hmm. and say, what are our metadata needs? Mm -hmm. What do you want to know about the material in this collection? And that's when we look at our existing standards, see if we already have a standard. 
Um, the audio projects that we're going to be working on in the future, we did create a, an audio standard, um, which will require very little editing for each new project. Um, whether that, whether we have a, a standard that will already work, or whether mm -hmm. we want to do something different that has additional fields, that has additional definitions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense, kind of defining these categorical templates for different content types that you might be handling. I think that can save your save you a lot of work um, as more and more of these projects come up. But there is also one of the things that I wanted to point out, and um, I don't know if there's too much more to say about it, but I, I've noticed that the collections that you have digitized and put into forum, they're all really unique to Drew like there's you guys have done a really good job of focusing on the things that you can deliver that no other institution can so you've focused on the things that are um, that you know you have a either a unique breadth or depth of um, and I think the result is that you have this really rich portfolio of digital collections after just you know two ish years of of using forum Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Hannah. Uh, it's well. It, we all have special collections and, and archival collections, and honestly, those are the only things we have that are unique to to each one of our institutions. So I I hope we can all be working together as a as a community to um, to make our local uh, riches a little more accessible to the rest, and you know, really take advantage of the affordances of, of the digital environment and the networked in, information landscape that we all live in. I mean, if we had somebody who wanted to do um, work with material that is duplicated elsewhere, we would help them. Mm -hmm. But when we have the choice to make, we're going to put our resources towards unique collections that, um, because duplicating somebody else's um, effort doesn't make sense with the amount of people we have. We do have some um, in collections that we are in the process of looking at doing digitally, that, you know, of bringing up digitally that are supported by donor funding, but the ones we have here are all materials that we felt were important enough to digitize and make available to the world to show um, collections that would otherwise not be available to the public. Yeah, I, I think that's also like um, kind of a, a nice note to close on because the reality is a lot of these collections which you digitized and published as public collections, the without this platform, they really wouldn't have been very widely seen. They, they're effectively siloed by the institutions that own them because they're just kind of so specialized and unique. So it's, it's really nice. I would also imagine that the student workers who work on these projects and the students who access the content, they're getting kind of a primary source education that is hard to come by these days. So there's a lot of value from a pedagogical point of view as well for using these. Exactly right. Yeah. Our mm -hmm. students, they're really pleased with that. Oh, that's Once, good. Well, we still have our audience. I will warn them if they go wandering around in the meth in the Nestorian crosses. <laughs> the Nestorians really like the Buddhist sun wheel, so just be aware. <laughs> encounter. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's. We were talking a little bit about kind of the how modern the design motifs in that collection are, and it really is. It's an interesting collection, and I encourage everybody to go kind of poke around in it. But there are some um, symbols that you might recognize that are a little surprising at first. In context, they make sense, though. All right. So I think um, I want to kind of do one last call for questions because we're all, we're one minute over. But I I kind of talked through our Q and A portion here. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to type them into the questions box or raise your hand. Um, we'll stick around for a few more minutes. But if there are no questions, then we'll probably just go ahead and wrap up. And um, my contact information is on the front um, screen. 
Um, I can also be found um, on the JSTOR forum mailing list. So if people have questions that come up later, I'd be happy to answer them or refer them to one of our, um, somebody else in the digital services group who's handling um, these materials who can answer the question for you. Well, Hannah, I want to thank you for uh, for reaching out to us and inviting us to do this. It's um, it's really great to have this platform. I, I think uh, we're a small institution. Our technology, central technology resources are, are very limited. So the ability to have a, a hosted you know, system with, uh, with great support is, is very key to our, our ongoing success. So thank you very much for uh, not just uh, JSTOR Forum, but for your uh, personal support for our projects. Oh, of course. It's my pleasure. You guys have done really amazing things in a very short amount of time. So thanks for joining us today and talking about them. Um, it looks like we're, there aren't any other questions coming in. So I think we can go ahead and wrap up. Um, thank you everybody for attending. I know this is a crazy week for most people who are just coming back from a very luxurious summer, I'm sure. Um, and we will see you all soon. So thanks again, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.